This episode includes frank discussion of sexual assault and other violent crimes. Listener discretion is advised. You have to have some empathy and be cognizant that whether you're a physician, a doctor, a, a psychiatrist, whoever you are, you are giving that person the control over their story so they can get it out in a meaningful way and learn to trust you. Mm -hmm. um, that is such powerful advice. Meandering in the margins of medicine, it's the Short Coat Podcast. Weird news, fresh views, helpful clues, and interviews. By students, for students. Subscribe to our weekly show at theshortcoat.com. Welcome back to the Short Coat Podcast, the show that gives you an inside look at medical school from the students drinking from that fire hose. It's a production of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. I'm Dave Etler. With me today in the SCP studio, she's offered plenty of evidence for her sacacity. It's M4, Jess DeHaan. Hey. Did I say sacacity? Yeah, I didn't know that Sagacity. was a word. <laughs> sagacity. I looked it up on the internet. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> she's been found guilty of possession of great wisdom. It's M4, Aline Sanduk. Hi, guys. Uh, but if you thought that was all short coats, that judgment will be reversed on appeal because Aline has invited a distinguished guest on the show today. Would you introduce our guest, Aline? I would love to. So we have Judge Rosemary Aquilina as our esteemed guest today. So Judge Aquilina is a seasoned jurist. You may have heard of her. She was involved in a, a very high profile case and actually many high profile cases, you know, dealing with criminal behavior and holding people accountable, you know, for their wrongdoing, but keeping the public safe. So Judge Aquilina first earned her degree in 1984 after going to Michigan State and getting her degree in English and has many notable achievements actually, and was the first female JAG in the Michigan Army National Guard, retired after 20 years as a military judge there, and then owned her own family law practice, and then ultimately was elected to the 55th District Court, where she served four years as chief judge and sobriety court judge, and then ultimately was elected as a 30th Circuit Court judge, where she is in her 14th year, I'm told, by the internet and you are currently also a law professor so not only an actively you know practicing judge but you're also teaching students involved in a lot of advocacy and we've got some social media that we'll share towards the end of the podcast but you have many accolades you're also an author a well-published author so i'll stop there and say thank you so much for you know doing this giving your time to this we're excited to talk with you today thank you for inviting me i think it's really important that medicine and law connect we could not agree more. We could not agree. And you've done such a nice job of you know, exemplifying that, not just in your advocacy work and in the film that we screened yesterday at the Englert downtown, but in every conversation you know, that we've been in the room with you for, you emphasize that at every turn. So I've got many questions. Well, we've had a chance to talk you know, quite a bit over the last few days. And I, I, you know, the most important thing that comes to mind for me is how physicians and care providers can be you know, more of a support you know, to some of the people that you see come through your court, not just victims and survivors, but defendants as well. You know, we're always thinking about trauma in the clinic and it's I think we're talking more about trauma now than ever before. But there's still kind of a lag in terms of, you know, people being mindful of it, screening for it, looking for it. You know, what role do you see physicians playing in the lives of the people that you run into? And, and what advice do you have for future practitioners and current practitioners? So I see physicians as healers. And, of course, people often come to you because they have a medical condition, a trauma, an emergent issue. And the first thing you have to do is to reassure them that they're in a safe place and they're going to be healed. Mm -hmm. And if they can't be healed, why or what the next protocol is and all of that. But it has to be in a safe zone. And that's what I do in the courtroom and what I did as a lawyer is to make sure that everybody I came in contact with and now come in contact with feels that they are in control, they are in a safe space, and they can tell me what the issue is, whether they are a victim, what happened to them, or whether they're a defendant, because the backstory helps me make decisions that are good, I hope. And same with the doctor, you have to know that medical history. Well, you're not going to get it if you're asking leading questions or shaming questions or saying, why are you here? I don't understand why doctors ask me, why are you here? Mm. You should know I'm here because I have an issue. What I always ask is, 
what would you like me to know and how can I help? So why isn't my doctor saying, what is going on? How can I help you? What would you like me to know? What mm-hmm. will make you feel comfortable in today's exam? whether it be in the emergency room or in the hospital room or in their office. And, you know, I've had doctors say to me, you women, I say, well, I'm having an issue. And they start out with saying, well, you women. Immediately I shut up, listened to what he had to say, got there and got out of there and never made another appointment because I don't want to be in a category of you women. I wanted to know why I was feeling the way I was. And ultimately I learned later it was because of my thyroid. I looked healthy, but this doctor said, you women. And I thought, wait a minute, I'm a human first. And I think everybody needs to be in a safe place, treated humanely with a doctor, lawyer, or judge who's willing to listen to the backstory, how we got there, and then what are some of the options? Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's you know, I think some of the training that you're talking about, it's it's starting to make its way. But, you know, we I would say the community of practitioners right now is very heterogeneous. You know, you have older guard people that see patients as recipients of care. And then you have kind of newer practitioners, you know, coming up in the profession that see patients as partners in care. And that's really kind of what you're talking about is inviting people to be partners in their experience and to feel like they have control. They need to have control. They need to feel that they're in a safe place, they need to have control. And when you give your patient or client control, then you not only do you have a better outcome, but they learn in the long haul of it, whatever you're dealing with, that they can trust you. And you're not going to have any success unless a patient trusts you or unless a defendant or victim trusts me. I'm not going to learn the full story. I'm not going to know how best to help them. Trust is earned, and you have to earn it the first minute that you meet someone. You know, to piggyback on that, something I've heard you say that I think is so powerful is that the victims and the survivors that you see, they themselves are the evidence. And that's you know something we talk about in healthcare is that if you if you take a really good history, you almost don't need to run any subsequent clinic. I mean, obviously, usually we do you know to substantiate things in an objective way. But if you invite the person to share their story fully, that's half the work. So in your you know in your courtroom, what do you see as the you know as the biggest barrier you know despite the role that you're playing what are some of the barriers for people to tell you their full stories by the time they get to me they have been so beaten down Mm -hmm. they have seen their doctor sometimes some doctors are better than others the doctor says well why didn't you come here sooner why did you take a shower all those things if they were assaulted you know why did you stay with him whatever it is and you know why shames and blames so you right away shut them up and they don't give you the full story. And I think what you're really touching upon is what makes or breaks a case in front of me because we deal in evidence. And as doctors, you are the first responders really to a lot of people who come in front of me. And so you're collecting that evidence and having those open-ended questions, documenting things, making sure that they're not questioned too many times, that there's forensic questioning, that you bring in law enforcement when needed or law enforcement brings you someone when needed. So we have that documentation and we're not saying, well, why did this happen? Are you sure this is what happened? You're, it's not your judgment. Leave it to the jury. Leave it to the legal system. Do what you're supposed to do to treat the patient. Make sure they feel safe. Document what you can and let the legal system work. By the time a case gets to me, sadly, prosecutors often will not issue as many charges as they should for every time someone is sexually assaulted or punched or a man or a child, there should be a charge. But ultimately prosecutors like to win. Mm -hmm. So instead of charging 10 or 20 or 100, they will charge two or three because they're certain that's where the evidence is. People Mm -hmm. are the evidence. And one of the things doctors can do is to document the cuts, the bruises, the mental state, who was with them, the torn clothing, whatever it is, so that 
you can, with your file, come in and say, this is what I saw. And of course, people, when they tell a doctor a statement for treatment, that can come in as evidence because it's deemed to be reliable because why would somebody lie to you about wanting treatment? So you are evidence collectors for us and prosecutors should really rely on that evidence. And then prosecutors should not dismiss counts just because they think, well, these three are the best ones that will win on. Let the jury decide. The jury may decide not guilty on all of them. They may decide guilty on all 10 counts. They may pick one or two guilty and the rest not guilty, but it's their decision based on the evidence that both attorneys bring in. And when you do not collect the proper evidence, it becomes harder to prosecute and then victims feel re-victimized, re-violated, and they learn not to trust the legal system, the medical system, law enforcement, and many of them end up in the mental ward. They end up bulimic, cutting, committing suicide, being so angry they then commit crimes, and the outcome's not good. We really need to treat people holistically and not make judgment. Judgments are for the jury. I just want to jump in here. It sounds to me like this is a common occurrence for doctors to sort of overstep or ask questions that impair the case later. I don't know how common it is. I know that I've heard from a number of victims who have contacted me around the world and have said, I couldn't go see my doctor because I felt that they didn't believe me or that they blamed me for what happened to my body or they were not trauma informed. So when they gave me the breast exam, they didn't explain to me that they were then going to touch me and why or did a vaginal exam and they didn't explain to me. So I started screaming. I leapt off the table and I ran out. Hmm. And so we need doctors who are trauma informed, who are patient, who give the patients their time to explain in their time, in their way, what happened and leave these questions that are open ended. So they get the best information. And that is not happening across the board. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it has more, applications than even maybe someone who you suspect there might just be sexual trauma in. I've as I'm going into OB guy and I've been doing research on the psychology behind like why women choose to birth in home settings versus hospitals. And so often it has to do with they feel lack of control. We're in the hospital and they feel like their uh, choices were not explained to them. If they had a differing opinion, then they were looked down on and they weren't allowed to pursue that. And because of that lack of control, even if there was a good outcome in the end in terms of like there was no major morbidity to the woman or to her child, it can actually studies have shown if they felt that lack of control, they were at a much higher rate of having postpartum depression, Mm. PTSD. Mm -hmm. And then normally that's what shoots them into the next birth. They say, no, no, I don't care what risk factors I have I'm not going back into a hospital again and so this has just so many wide-ranging applications it's not just for you know somebody who thinks that they're going to be dealing with you know traumatized patients even if you're an endocrinologist trauma-informed care is important in them helping patients feel like they have not lost control over their body the moment that they come into your office I think doctors need to remember informed consent Mm -hmm. and informed consent isn't just you know, this is a procedure sign here. It's really at every stage. I'm going to touch you and here's why. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. If you are uncomfortable, you know, you can even tell the patient there's a safe word like the word red or mom or hope or whatever word they like. If they use that, then the doctor should stop and explain or see what the issue is. And they're not trauma-informed enough to do that. They're not patient. It's about getting through 50 patients and and getting home at the end of the day. And maybe you ought to have 40 patients and get home at the end of the day but have spent enough time with your patient so that you can take the time to explain to them because then you develop trust. Mm -hmm. You give them the control. They're in a safe environment. And it really heightens the oath that we've all taken to protect. And that was something I heard you say. There was someone who, to get the story, you let her, she would give, you know, a few minutes of testimony and then have to go lie down on the bathroom floor for 30 minutes. And you gave her as much time as she needed. And I I definitely thought of times when I worked in the ER and I was not patient with people. And I was thinking about the 30 other people in the waiting room I needed to see. And I, I rushed them. 
Yeah. And I remember when you said that last night, I was like, I did that wrong. I don't want to do that again to somebody. Yes. For our listeners, let's just step back. So I had a, a victim who was rather young and she was raped by her father who was in the room and she was going through really the trauma of publicly testifying and she was very upset and her life had never been the same since and so she was testifying she would get through about 15 minutes and then feel sick and i'd say let's take a break and she would literally go in the bathroom and curl into the fetal position on the bathroom floor for 30 minutes and then feel ready and then come back and testify another 15 minutes and we did this for two days we got through the testimony but we had to give her her time to really regroup, talk again, regroup, because it's tough, even on direct, when it's really open-ended questions to get your story out when you're facing someone, your abuser in the room, and there's this big old judge in a black uh, robe and viewers and, you know, the public and the jury, there's 14 jurors Mm -hmm. that will eventually be whittled down to 14. And then to be cross-examined, cross-examination is not nice. It's out of order. It suggests an answer they should keep the answer to yes no but they can't help but getting angry and Mm -hmm. upset and confused and i made sure she had enough time to feel like she was in a safe heard environment now the jury gets to decide her credibility but i have to make sure that everyone is in a situation where they can testify comfortably and for her to have continued testifying vomiting in a garbage bag crying shaking that wouldn't have moved the case forward so you have to have some empathy and be cognizant that whether you're a physician a doctor a a psychiatrist whoever you are you are giving that person the control over their story so they can get it out in a meaningful way and learn to trust you Mm -hmm. that is such powerful advice i feel like that is applicable, you know, not just in law and healthcare, but just in life in general. I feel like that should be such a fundamental aspect of people's personal relationships. Well, you know? even if you're a mom yeah. or, or a yeah. dad, you know, and your kid comes home crying and sobbing and shaking, give them the time and the breaks they need. Don't just say, well, you know, I got to make dinner <laughs> because yeah. you're going to cut them off. You're never, ever in your whole entire life going to know what you should have known about that story if you cut them off and if you don't make them feel like they're the only person that's important in that moment. Now, I know in healthcare, there are definitely financial incentives for us to have RVUs and productivity and see so many patients. In your field, I know that was something you got some flack for, was allowing every victim to give their statement in the trial with Larry Nasser. And I, I just want to know what incentives are in your field. Like, why don't people do that? Is Are you only given a certain amount of money per case? And so the more you spread that out yeah. over, you're losing some, you know? It's I don't not know how that money. Works. We are... Well, and it may be somewhere that I don't know because everything seems to be driven by money, but they Mm do monitor our caseloads and how quick we are and Mm -hmm. how many cases we do in a year and a Mm -hmm. month and we can't be behind or we don't get enough, we don't get the extra vacation and this Mm -hmm. and that. Mm -hmm. I don't give a damn. Mm -hmm. It's not my courtroom. It's the people's courtroom. And I think it's a violation of the Constitution to say, okay, well, you only get so many minutes because I have to move on to the next case. I think anybody affected by a case has a right to speak in the courtroom. It's their courtroom, their time, their moment. And I make better decisions when I hear from both sides. When I hear from anybody who's affected by the case, I'm not going to stop. The Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court can tell me to stop. I will get off the bench and legislate for the ability to hear all victims. When you're looking at crime, victim doesn't have a border. Mm-hmm. If a mother is raped, it affects her husband, it affects her mother, it affects her children, it affects a lot of people, maybe even her doctor, her friends, people who know her say, oh my gosh, you know, mm-hmm. and they get affected. They may want to testify. I let them because crime has no border. I'm sure that when you have cases in the emergency room, you don't just see the the parent or the husband or wife. You also see the extended family, the neighbors and the friends because they have loved ones who are afraid for them, who care about them. It's the same in the courtroom. I'm not ever going to cut someone short. I think that's an abuse of the oath that I took. What would you say to the criticism that by spending so much time on this one case that could be processed faster, you're 
taking away, you're not being able to get through so many other cases and, and backlogs. How would you respond? Cause I know that's the, I think the thing we hear in healthcare is like, we got so many other people that you're not going to see today because of this. They all count. And when they come in front of me, they're also going to get that time. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to rob everyone of their time. I'm going to give everyone their time. Mm -hmm. And of course, same with doctors. You know, if, if there's an emergent case, you take that emergency over and above. If I have an emergency, sometimes I have to have emergency hearings. I'm going to interrupt my day and have that emergency hearing. So you hearing. triage with I your triage own. as yeah. well. Yeah. And it's all balancing, but in the end, every single person should feel that when they leave the courtroom, when they leave the judicial process, whatever aspect they were in it, they should feel that they were heard and treated properly mm -hmm. and feel whole again as best as we can help them. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean they always win their case, doesn't mean they always get you know what they wanted, but it means that they felt heard, believed, listened, and not discounted, but rather valued. And I think that we want the same out of our doctors. And you know, in terms of me being a patient, I want to make sure that my doctor cares about me, not the insurance company. Mm -hmm. Short Coats, we love to hear from you, no matter what it's about. So call us at 347-SHORT-CT with questions, shower thoughts, complaints about your situation, whatever you like. We'll talk about it on the show. You touched on a really important point there about making people whole. In case any listener hasn't read your book, you know, just watch me. It's an amazing memoir. And Thank you. I've truly enjoyed reading it. And, you know, it's it's given us and me, I think, and I'm sure everyone who's read it, just a little bit of insight into, you know, how you became the person that you are today. Something I wanted to bring up is when you're talking about making people whole again, there was a story about, you know, one victim that you worked with who had her, her best friend, quote unquote, taken away. It's something you really fought for to bring back. I was wondering if you could share that story as just an example of the things you yeah. do to help people become whole again. I think that we have an obligation to look at the rules and follow them, but think outside the box. There's a lot of ways that things can be done, whether it's medicine, whether you're a bus driver and need to take a different route, or whether you're a judge. It doesn't really matter. And I had a case where a father was watching TV with his 12-year-old daughter and the mom went shopping and they had done this for her whole life. They would watch TV in the master bedroom. That's where the extra TV was. They would just sort of relax. So on this particular day, he decided to rape her. And thankfully, she had a mom. When she got home, she told what dad did. And mom did the right thing and chose the child over the dad and called police. And it was substantiated that this little girl had been raped. And the mom had kicked him out of the house. And of course, the police arrested him. He got out on bond. When he was kicked out of the house, he not only took his personal belongings that he needed, but also took the family dog. I learned about this because if anybody's watched me, I take my time. I listen to everybody. And when I heard her story and when I heard what the dad said and, and everybody who spoke, what I pieced together was that when he left, he took the family dog. Well, this wasn't the family dog. This was her dog. Mm. And predators, when they want to keep control, they keep control in lots of different ways. And this was dad's way of saying, I still have control over you because I took your little dog. And he was going to prison. And I said, where's the dog? He said, well, I gave the dog to my friend who's going to care for it while I'm gone. And I said, no. That dog has 24 hours to get back to your daughter. And he said, well, you can't do that. I said, yes, I'm ordering it in restitution. Restitution is to make someone whole for any personal or property damage. There's no way you can unrape someone. There's no way you can fix the trauma of this little girl saying, I will always love you. I don't understand what you did, but I do not like you and I never want to see you again. I don't understand. But what I could do was give back her best friend. So I ordered the dog back in restitution. And the lawyer said to me, I've never had a judge order restitution in the form of a dog 
and I said, what do you have now? you got 24 hours or you're both in contempt. <laughs> and then when the case was closed, the court clerks called me and said, judge, there's no line for dog. And I said, either make one, <laughs> either make one or do whatever you got to do. But that's what it is. That's what's ordered. Fix the problem. And the dog got to her. Mm-hmm. And because this was really a way of a predator keeping control. Mm-hmm. I also made sure that she had a copy of the transcript so that when she's older and when she's married, having kids, when she goes through puberty, whatever it is that she's going through, she really understands that she was heard, believed, listened Mm to. And so I gave her a copy of the transcript so that she could go through it. I didn't actually give it to her. I gave it to her mother so that when the right time came, she could go through that transcript with a trained trauma therapist who could work through what happened, what the dad said, what she said, and really to understand she's whole, she's loved, she matters, and what it was dad who was the bad guy, not her. She didn't do anything wrong. He did everything wrong. So I, there's many ways you can make a person whole, and that was how I did it in that case, and that's how I've done it in many cases. Mm-hmm. That's so interesting. I I don't think of judges in this way. And I think it's because what I know about judges doesn't come from knowing any judges. It comes from from television. It comes from movies. It comes from what I see on the news. It's fascinating to me. Is this a common approach? No, I get a lot of crap for it, and I don't care. If somebody wants to get me off the bench, and maybe someday you'll all read about Judge Aquilina getting kicked off the bench. Well, when Judge Aquilina does, if in fact that does happen, Judge Aquilina is going to get louder and louder about what I can talk about. I'm restricted to talk about some things because I am a sitting judge. But if they want to get me off, it's not going to shut me up. It's going to make me get louder and cause more change. I don't think that judges need to go by the black letter law it says this so it must be this i think the law gets applied to each case as it's needed and there has to be some healing involved there has to be some punishment involved there has to be restitution there has to be a realization that we're all human mistakes can be made and we can be rehabilitated but also victims also need to be heard and believed and be part of the solution so we know how they feel about the crime and so there's some deterrence and healing i don't see my black robe as the robe of the punisher i Mm -hmm. see it as the robe of the the magical robe of healing is how i see it well and it's it's about it, it seems to be about you know looking beyond your immediate goals and projecting forward what you can do to help this person, whoever you're talking about, move on as best they can. Right. It's really, whether you're talking about the lab coat or the the physician's coat or the judge's robe, they're all very powerful. They mean something in our world. And so when I say something, when I'm in my robe, It's very meaningful to defendants. It's meaningful to victims. And the victim may have heard that they matter from their therapist. They may have heard that they matter from their mother, their grandmother, their husband. But when I say it, they tend to believe it. They tend to internalize it. And I know this because they come back. I always invite people back. Come back and show me, you know, how you're doing. Come back and show me the magnificent things you've done. And they do. And I'm always impressed by what they've done. And they say to me, both victims and defendants, say to me, I did this because of you. And I always say, no, I just opened the door. I told you it was possible. You made it possible. You are your own superhero. You took your power and control back. You should be proud of you. I didn't do anything. And I think it's important that people know that they can make things happen and that they have the control and the power over their life. And when they're following someone else in a wrong way, they're giving up their power. And really your superpower first and foremost is being your own hero and being that example to your friends, your community and yourself. I always thought it would be fun to play a judge on Law and Order. I think so too, but I want them to put, to put me in there, my way, and then my, might shake up the show, huh? Yeah, I mean, I always like imagine myself being like Mr. So and So, 
You're in contempt. Mm. <laughs> so contempt is fun. I, I sometimes have to, <laughs> I sometimes have to pound the gavel and I tell them contempt is ninety three days and or seventy five hundred dollars and then they act badly and I pound the gavel and everybody jumps and law enforcement takes them away ninety three days. Oh, wow. And wow, uh, I once power. had a grandmother who I was sentencing the grandson for some really horrifying crimes, and I gave her three chances to be quiet. And then she she yells out, blood of Jesus. I said, ma'am, 93 days contempt, you say it again. Blood of Jesus, ma'am, 93 days. And the gavel goes down. And I said, ma'am, you're going to jail. And the officers, the deputies, no, I'm going to keep going. So they're trying to get her out. And she says, I gladly go to jail for my grandson. I said, 93 days, ma'am. Blood of Jesus, another 93 days, ma'am. And they took her out. <laughs> Oh, wow. Don't call your bluff. That's what I just learned. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Right. So You follow through is what you're saying. <laughs> I, I follow through. And, you know, it's not about really about being mean. It's about in my courtroom and in any courtroom, you're going to have mothers and babies and children and old people. And we have to keep control. And if you get that disrespect, you are showing disrespect to the court system, the legal system, the victims, just everything. And it's safety. So safety. Safety first, and if I have to have contempt, great. And that's why I have very low blood pressure. Every even when I had my twins, the doctors kept saying, "Are you all right? You're going to faint." I'm like, "No, that's just me." But they said, "But you have twins. I, we've never seen this." I said, "I have contempt powers. It keeps my blood low. <laughs> it's a good prescription." <laughs> I love that. Contempt is fun. That's it's the takeaway. Fun. That's that that should be the tagline for this episode. Yeah. You know, something that you you've really emphasized at multiple intervals is that, you know, on top of your sensitivity to victims and trauma, you extend that humanity to the defendants too. And so and that really, you know, counters this idea that you have to pick a side when there's been wrongdoing. But mm. you you've really shattered that myth, you know, for me and I hope for some of the folks listening that you can hold someone accountable for their wrongdoing and also treat them like a human being. That's really restorative justice. Yeah. Uh, it's it, You have to be cognizant of the pain and the trauma the victim has gone through and really listen to them and address them. Let them talk as long as they want. Let them swear. Whatever it is that's going on because they're healing. You can watch it. I can physically watch their healing yeah. begin when they when they speak out and they really start to take control. But also, victims need to be told that you can do better. You know, you've done all of this crime. If you took that energy, you know, you can do better. What is it you want to be? And so many defendants say, I don't know. I've never thought of it. You know, they didn't have a mommy and daddy like mm -hmm. like you and I who said, you can go to college, you can be all you can be. They grew up on the streets or they grew up with a mother addicted to heroin or what have you, and they didn't know that they could be anybody. And so when I tell them that... They're amazed. And I'll say, well, what is it you like to do? Well, I like to do art. Well, there's an art school. How about we put you in, the, in that school? There's lots of things we talk about. And I tell them to come back and show me the great things they've done. I have had people come back who now work under very famous artists. They have music contracts. They have their 10-year AA coin, which they give to me. They have healthy babies. They finally have a paycheck. They're not being paid under the table anymore. It's a real paycheck. And they're so proud they've held this job. And they say, I just had to show you. And they say, you know, you're the first person who told me I mattered. Now, isn't that sad that someone is in front of a judge who's committed a crime and I was the first person who said, you mattered, you can do better. I, I want you to come back and show me the magnificent things you do out in the world. And when I'm told that, I just think, wow. You know, we all need to turn to the person next to us, even if you don't know them well, and say, I think you're great. How are you doing today? You matter in this world. Can I help you? That's such a beautiful thought. I wanted to ask you more, you know, about some of the things that you have offered to defendants. You know, you mentioned sending them to art school. What are some of the things that you've, you know, offered to help rehab them or put them on the right path? It's really interesting because it's that's a mixed bag. Defendants, we're not born to crime. Mm -hmm. 
It's the environment, it's things that happen. And I have had, for example, I had one young man and I looked at him and said, this crime does not fit you. I, I want to know how we got here mm. and what's going on with you. And he started to cry. said, I lost my grandmother and she raised me and I just really feel lost without her. And it was just this anger and grief that was driving him. And I said, you know, that's really like that pebble in your shoe that just got bigger and bigger. And finally, you know, it's the pain of that has come out. And he stopped crying and he said, the only one that's ever used that example to me is my grandmother. And I said, because she's here standing with you and she wants you to do great things. She does not want you to do this. And she would be the first to tell you that you can do better. And this is not how she raised you. And he cried again. And he said, that would be exactly what she said. How do you know that? And I said, because she's here with you. And she's in a different form, but I can feel her. And I know you can too. And he did really well on probation and really turned his life around. So grief counseling, sometimes it's they've lost a child and they can't get over it. And it's, you know, it's anger driven. So they go through grief counseling for that. Or it's a child abuse case. They were raised with being hit with the belt. They don't know they can't hit children, their children with the belt. So we go through parenting classes and cognitive therapy and one-on-one therapy, group therapy, because groups are great because they call you on your crap. If you are in a treatment, whether it's for domestic violence or drugs, and you're either not talking or you're talking crap, the group's going to call you on it and you're going to have to get real honest. And that really helps people. And there are men's support groups, women support groups, AA, NA, CA for, for addicts. There's so many different programs out there. I have just an enormous number of gun cases right now. So every single case, unless they're going to prison, every single case that includes a gun, even if that charge is dismissed, I am sending them to a gun safety class because I know that it's not the last time they're going to have a weapon. And I'm in the military, so I can break down and clean up and put back together all sorts of weapons, but I respect them. I don't want to own one because I respect them, but they have to know they can't let the gun roll around in their car. They have to have a safety on it. They shouldn't have it loaded. There's lots of things. They have to clean it. They have to zero it. They have to treat it with respect. I've had cases. I had one case recently where a gun was rolling around in this guy's van and his six-year-old picked it up and shot himself with it. Now, thankfully, the six-year-old lived, but the the bullet went through his arm and part of his chest and, and the doctors were able to heal him and help him and the child's fine. And the dad is beside himself, but he's getting a gun safety class because once you're enamored with guns, it's not the last time you're going to have a gun. And I think everybody should know how to use a weapon because even and even doctors have a gun safety class because when somebody comes in with a gun and you have to remove it from them, you ought to know how to pick it up, how to take the bullets out of the chamber. If there's an emergent situation and you're tussling with someone and there's a gun, maybe you might need to fire it, but let's know how to do that safely. There's just too many out on the street that are illegal. They're finding their way everywhere. So I'm trying to look at whatever the crime is, what's the underlying reason, and how can I get this defendant treated and um, to do better in the world. Sometimes it's a combination of a high school diploma and college credit because there's some programs for that. There's trade schools. There's lots of programming and they never thought they could go because no one told them they were worth something that they could accomplish, that they could own a business. And I tell them they can, and it's a great world. And if they get past this, you know, they can accomplish anything. And I want to know. I'll be the first person who eats in their restaurant, the first person that takes a ride in their Uber, the first person that buys their art project. And they come back and say, here's what I did. And they're so damned proud. And I'm just really proud of them. You're, ev- you're everyone's mom. Yeah, she is. <laughs> you're mom to the world. <laughs> Short Coats, if you're enjoying our conversation today, I'd be grateful if you'd let people know by posting a story on Instagram or Facebook or tweeting about us. And don't forget to tag us in your post. Yeah. Thank you. I, I want to take it down a slightly dark turn, though. 
So you've described with great eloquence, like, yes, we want it to be restorative justice. We want to seek restitution. But I've also seen with you your discernment and knowing I don't know if there is a path of recovery for this person and I I need to keep them away from the rest of society. And I want to bring this up because yes. I think what I've seen is my friends who are in, in law enforcement and, and military, like, I think they have a great sense of justice and they tend to sway towards like i don't want to give that person the benefit of the doubt and then i find people in medicine are they swayed to the other way where we're so compassionate that i've seen we can be easily taken advantage of easily naive yes easily assaulted and Mm -hmm. and that's what i love about you is that you have such a balanced perspective of mercy and justice Talk to us a little bit about that. Like, you, right. you know, the criminal yeah. masterminds. So I do have a, a lot of people and I, I get what's called a pre-sentence investigation report before sentencing. And so this report can be 10 pages, can be 30 or 50 pages, but talks about the, the history and I have the whole criminal history. And I do see escalation often. And so I will see someone who first does shoplifting and then they might use some illegal drug or whatever. But then now they're assaulting officers. They're assaulting assaulting their spouses they've got guns and they're robbing these armed robberies and you see this escalation and sometimes i can intervene and figure out okay what's going on but when i see the escalation and they don't care i'm more than happy to put them in prison because they cannot be with the rest of us i had a man who was on parole and he got out well obviously if he's on parole he got out but he was in prison for quite a long time criminal sexual assault cases got out on parole and then went back to his family and befriended a girl who was probably in her 30s but she was pretty low functioning a very very kind and wonderful human being but became kind of the family's gopher and ultimately what he did to her was started raping her and what he liked to do is hog tie and rape his women and his family would not report but he had one brother who said this is wrong and the family didn't want to report because she was like the family gopher and they went and she went and got groceries and cigarettes and she did a lot of things and they treated her really like a slave and they didn't care if he had sex with her and she finally figured out this is wrong and now he was hurting her when he was binding her so the one brother realized what was going on and reported and he was convicted now he It was a horrible jury trial. He was convicted, and I sentenced him to life, and he threatened me. He threatened the prosecutor. It's online. If anybody wants to read the story, it's pretty horrible. But, you know, my life was threatened. The prosecutor's life was threatened. We were both female. He wanted to keep control. Can he be rehabilitated? No. Should he remain behind bars forever? Absolutely. Will he get out and do it again if he's released? I have no doubt that will happen. Mm -hmm. But... Ultimately, what can I do in prison? I will order animal therapy if they are lucky enough to be in a prison that has animal therapy because that lets them learn to love because animals learn or animals love unconditionally and people can learn to love maybe he never learned to love but it's really phenomenal what they can do there. I keep them busy in trade school, cognitive therapy, mental health counseling and treatment. And so even though he's behind bars, I'm still treating him as a human being. These are only recommendations to the wardens. But the wardens who I met, who I know, who I converse with are really fabulous people. And they want to make sure the people behind bars are getting treatment. So there's lots of programming. And I just want to make a pitch for anybody who's a legislator out there or knows legislators. There's 1.2 million people who are mentally ill in prison who need to be treated and in a facility and not in prison. Mm -hmm. We need to open up those facilities. We need to get mental health treatment. We need to get the meds out there so they're not self-medicating. We need to make sure that we're treating the mentally ill humanely and not incarcerating them. And unfortunately, I have a lot of cases where there's nowhere else to put someone except behind bars and treat them behind bars. That is cruel and unusual punishment. It is against our constitution, but there's no place to put people and keep them safe and our communities safe. So that's something else that I think medicine and law and the legislators ought to partner on to figure out and solve. 
Speaking of cruel punishment, I don't know if it's unusual. What are your thoughts on solitary confinement? The more I've been learning about it, the more appalled I've been. But So solitary confinement should only be used in extreme circumstances. And it shouldn't be used as a norm or as a, a you know, even a temporary punishment because it does cause mental illness. Mm-hmm. I did have a case, a very sad case, of a man who was transitioning into a woman. And it was about halfway there, and she was arrested because the heroine and our jail did not have a place to put her. Couldn't put her with the women, put her with the men, but because of safety, put her in solitary confinement. Mm-hmm. When she was brought in front of me, I could, I just looked at her and I said, I don't want to look at this file. I want to know what's wrong, what's happened. Mm-hmm. And she said to me, I've been in solitary, I'm transitioning, and I haven't been able to talk to anyone. And mm-hmm. she described to me this horrible isolation. And I said, I don't, I'm very sorry. I don't know why they did that. They did not let me know that was not an order to my court, but I don't run the jail. I'm going to give you a PR bond today. You are going to be released with an apology, and then we'll proceed with this case when you're outside. And then I got off the bench and I called the sheriff and said, how dare you? And if somebody comes in who it can't be placed because of this situation, then you need to call me because I'm going to give them a PR bond with a GPS tether if they need it. But we're not going to put them in isolation. That is cruel and unusual punishment. And look at what's happened. And he said, well, in the new jail, we won't have this problem. And I said, well, you're not going to have this problem on my watch because it's a, called a PR bond and you're going to call me. Sadly, she was so then damaged and traumatized, she went back to using heroin and she died on the streets. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, I guess you could arguably say, well, you caused that. Well, maybe I did, but isolation, I think, was more damaging than what she did. She at least died the way she wanted to, and she she was an addict. She had been clean for several months because they had her behind, but what they did is they just so traumatized her. There was no surprise that or she went back. how on. much did the social isolation contribute to exactly. her state? I mean, that's that's what I've been exactly. you know, reading about. It just propels them into more high-risk right. behaviors and when they get out. Yeah, and that's really my ras- rationalization. I didn't cause it. I think the isolation traumatized her so bad. That's the only way she could check out. There was nowhere yeah. uh, for her to get help. And that's something in, in healthcare. I think we all have this consensus like, yeah, we don't think that's a good idea. But I have never seen an initiative talking about it. I haven't seen it on the ballot. I don't even know who who do I talk to to try to say, like, let's change this. Well, where's that role for us as healthcare providers? It's the same thing about what's our role fidelity when it comes to gun safety laws. When you were talking about mm-hmm. that, there's these intersecting lines. But in healthcare, I'm so focused studying on medicine, you know, and doing the right thing ethically. I don't always know, like, Where do I go to to get these things changed legislatively other than? Well, first of all, legislators get there by your vote. Mm -hmm. So when they knock on your door or when they send you a flyer, they want a contribution. They're only going to get it if you say, this is what I want. Mm -hmm. I want this bill. When will you do it? How long is it going to take to pass? And then when they give you the rhetoric of, well, it's probably going to die in committee, you say no. You have a priority bill. Yes, it will go to committee, but we know you can recall it from committee, put it on the Senate floor, vote on it, send it to the next house. They can do it. When you want a bill, when you want our money, you pass a bill in two or three weeks. When we need something that serves the public, it takes two, three, ten years. Sometimes we never get it. Why is that? We're not going to vote for you without a commitment. Mm Mm-hmm. We're not going to contribute to you without a commitment. Mm-hmm. And we all need to take that stand. But sadly, too few of us know how to do that. I know because I worked in the legislature. Maybe one day I'll run again for, maybe I'll run for the U.S. Senate or do something like that. Because I know how to do it. And uh, there's so many back doorways to get legislation passed. My question is, legislators, why aren't you doing it? Why don't you care? Can you write me a book called Lobbying for Healthcare Dummies? I, I would <laughs> I really appreciate actually, that. Actually, I teach a class called Legislative Process, and I'm taking the inside things that I know, and I'm actually writing a book about how it works and how things actually can get done and how you can get involved. So yeah. I don't know when I'm actually going to okay. finish it because I've got other books in front of it, but I am okay. absolutely, because it's so important. I will buy that. Yes, maybe we should sign up for your mailing list yes. so we get the first yeah. notification. My AP government class was too long ago for this. <laughs> 
this is a while. class. Right. 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 Well, that's all really practical advice, honestly, and things that I, I, I plan to look into. You know, something else you mentioned kind of along that vein, you reminded us in some of the conversations we've had that your position is electable. You know, and I, I literally forget that I have the power to elect mm-hmm. our judges, you know, based on whether or not I feel they're using their position in a competent and ethical way. So that's yeah. another another way for listeners to think about. You know. And there are some states where legislators, like the governor will appoint the judge. I don't know how many states are left doing that. Most are elected positions in Texas. They are, they're running as Democrats and Republicans in our state. We are nonpartisan. I think Texas is trying to change so their judges are nonpartisan. You really want nonpartisan judges mm-hmm. because you don't want, as a Republican, to appear in front of a Democratic mm-hmm. judge. That gives the appearance that, you know, you've already got something against you. And we should all appear in front of judges who are fair and impartial and uh, politics and religion, sexual preference aside, right? Mm-hmm. doesn't matter who you are. And I think that it, all judges should be by election, not appointment. And if you are appointed because it's midterm, then you stand for election afterwards. And that's because otherwise legislators get to sort of feather their nest by having judges who think their way. Mm-hmm. And that's not a representation of the people. The voters, if you come in contact with any elected person, it's likely going to be a judge. Because you're going to get a traffic ticket, you might have to sue your landlord, you're going to have someone die in your family's probate court, you may need guardianship, which is probate court. So there's lots of different parts of court where you will come in contact with a judge. And so you should get to know your judges. They shouldn't be last on the ballot. They should be first and you should read and learn about them. And if you don't know, just Google it or ask your neighbor, your friendly cop or lawyer and say, you know, who do you like? What's wrong? What's right? What it's funny, I think, from my perspective as a voter, learning about judges is actually harder than, you know, learning about, poli- you know, politicians. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for, so, for instance, in Iowa, judges are appointed by merit, I believe, by the governor. And then there's a retention vote at some point further down in their, you know, after, after they've served a term. And when I went to look this year about judges, the easiest poss- the easiest thing to find was whether they were appointed by a a Republican or a Democrat. I mean, mm-hmm. it was awfully hard to find information about well, that that would be, you know, appropriate to make a decision on whether they should be retained or not. Right. You know, one of the things you can do is have your local radio stations or even with a podcast have a debate. Ask the judges questions. What are you going to do? What have you done? What are your beliefs? What kind of cases do you handle? Mm. What are some of the pitfalls? What are things you'd like to see changed? And then see if that agrees with your gut or not. You'll know. We've talked about a lot of things and I, you know, I know that you've commented publicly quite a bit, but I, I I feel like I would be doing a disservice to our listeners, you know, if we didn't talk about the case that really, you know, brought you to prominence in the eyes of the public and, and really positioned you as an advocate, you know, for victims and survivors everywhere. So I, I know there's many questions that I could ask, you know, what would you like people to know about the USA gymnastics scandal and, and how, you know, some practical advice for all of us listening on how we could have prevented that or been more of a support to these to these people who were affected. That's a really good question. The case uh, against Larry Nasser never should have been mine. If one person would have reported 25 years earlier, or maybe even longer, I, I think the first person who complained was 25, 28 years ago, and it was all shoveled under the rug as, oh, it's no, no, it's, it's okay, it's medical, and by the way, you don't want to affect everybody, but we could do this. And there were many complaints over the years. They were shoveled under the rug, and every single time it wasn't, the complaint wasn't reported, wasn't investigated, it allowed hundreds more girls to be assaulted. And so I think the biggest message from that case and from all of the cases that have been that are like that, whether it's the churches, the the Boy Scouts, the U of M Dr. Anderson case, if you see abuse, if you suspect abuse, you don't have to be right. You just have to report it to the proper authorities and let them do an investigation. And then if there's something, let it go to the jury. But If you do not report abuse, you are a co-conspirator to the abuse. And I want people to think about it like that. 
there's no crime for being a co-conspirator to that abuse. But in my mind, if you don't report it, you're a co-conspirator. And things are changing. There are some laws being proposed that if you don't report, you can be prosecuted. It could be a misdemeanor. You could be deemed a co-conspirator depending on what the crime is. Now, are those laws going to pass? Probably not. But I think people ought to think about it because it's okay to be wrong. But if you're right, you're saving a life. And in the Nasser case, you would have saved, there's at least 505 girls who were assaulted multiple, multiple times, some of them hundreds of times. They would have all been saved and free of that, or most of them would have. And it just didn't happen in the Dr. Anderson case at U of M. A thousand, over a thousand men were assaulted by him doing prostate exams on them monthly and having them masturbate and then using their semen to create what he wanted to do, which was the best black athlete. There's so much going on at these universities report. And if, you know, you are supposed to be in a room, you're a doctor, you're a uh, an assistant, you're a nurse, you're supposed to be in a room with someone who's doing an exam, stay in the room. If they kick you out, make a call, report it, because those are basic ethical standards. And if someone's not meeting that, talk about it. Don't be afraid of repercussions, because it's about caring for your patient, your colleague, the gymnast, you know, the just human beings to make sure that they're safe. So speaking out is never, ever wrong, nor is it punishable. How does somebody who does come forward protect themselves from repercussions? Because I can imagine that in the case of Larry Nassar and and, and the USA Gymnastics scandal, that one of the motivations for not coming forward was to, you know, because it's it, it's it's an existential threat to, you know, sort of lose your, your job or lose your you know, to lose your livelihood because you came forward and somebody was like, well, we don't believe you. Not only don't we believe you, we're going to fire you. I, I agree wholeheartedly that the, the most appropriate thing to do in that situation is still to come forward and and state the truth and push for, you know, justice in that situation. But also there has to be the acknowledgement that that's a really hard thing to do when you feel like you're not going to be protected by whatever system you're a part of. What kind of system do you want to be part of where if you report a rape or some kind of bad action, you're going to be fired? That is a threat that silences. Don't be afraid of the threat. Be afraid of not reporting because then you are complicit. And when you are complicit in this crime, you could be a co-conspirator. They could see you as, well, you knew you didn't do anything. You're going to be fired anyway. And so you need to keep your power and you need to report. Always rise above. And those people who rise above tend to go higher, not lower. If you want to not report because you are fearful, know that there's a problem and know that you're going to be part of a sinking ship. And if you really feel that there is a repercussion, then talk to a lawyer, talk to HR, talk to those higher people and say, I'm going to do this, but I need some protection. There are protections out there. There are laws who will protect you. But if you say nothing, you are part of the problem. You have to live with that. You're causing more harm and that harm may come back at you. So don't be a fear, fearful of the repercussion. Be fearful of whatever crime's going on continuing and you being somehow wrapped into that. Well, and something we've talked about is that, okay, some of these people, they might have reported it to the first line person, you know, this coach or this person. And then, oh, no, no, it's fine. He's fine. We all know him. We all love him. And so then they stopped and then they felt like I must be the crazy one. And I, I have personal yeah. stories as I've shared that I, I, I should have taken it on to the next level. But you feel like, well, they told me that there's nothing that can be done or this is fine or it's all in my head. And, you know, what you've shared and what you're telling people is trust your gut. Go up to the next echelon. OK, so maybe right. the the director of this hospital, this clinic, this program, my supervising physician, you know, they've said, oh, it's. It's just so-and-so. We all know him. We love him. You must be the one misunderstanding. And so then you think, okay, well, at least I reported it, right? My hands are clean. I did my job and reported it. 
But if if still nothing is being done or no, if no one says to you, I'll look into it. Yeah. So talk, take action, trust your gut, keep talking until you're heard and then treat yourself with kindness. You did what you could do, but there's lots of places to report any kind of crime, whether it's law enforcement, the attorney general, the FBI. If you are in a sports setting, you go to the coach. If it's the coach that's assaulting you, go you go to the next highest coach, the supervisor. You go to the police. You just keep talking and documenting. Rachel Den Hollander had mm-hmm. to go to the media mm-hmm. before somebody paid attention. Mm-hmm. So you just keep talking until you are heard and don't feel bad about it. The thing that you're talking about really is gaslighting is, first of all, we have predators grooming you to believe that they're the only one that can help you. They're the best one and they're safe with you when they're really not. Mm -hmm. And then when you say, but this isn't right, this doesn't feel good, this is something you're not supposed to do. Well, of course it is, you're wrong. You just don't know the medical profession, you don't know the legal Mm -hmm. profession, whatever Mm -hmm. it is. So they gaslight you. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes they'll even ghost you, so then they'll disappear for a while. So now you're feeling guilty. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Mm -hmm. in relationships there's love bombing where they just give you too many gifts, they're always there. It's almost like a stalking behavior. So when you have gaslighting, grooming, love bombing ghosting you have to learn what those are you need to look at what the signs are you can google it there's lots of lists of signs and if you think you're in a relationship like that go to a trauma therapist figure Mm -hmm. out with them are you suffering because of this go to a supervisor go to someone in authority who you trust a safe Mm -hmm. person law enforcement and figure out is this right or is this wrong is this a crime Mm -hmm. You know, the only thing I want to add to that is be prepared for people to not believe you. Even people you think are safe may not be as enlightened on this issue as you think they may be, but don't stop. You know, that that's kind of the resounding theme that I've taken from, you know, talking with you and, and the film, you know, at the heart of gold is keep asking until you find someone who believes and is willing to do something about it because they are they are out there but it's so easy to get discouraged and don't worry if if it's your mother your father your uncle your brother and they say you know don't do this because you're going to embarrass the family don't worry about embarrassing the family you will actually bring credit to your family for saving others and just remember to keep the in your inner power and move it forward to protect others and if the worst happens and you are the victim of a crime whether it's domestic violence rape robbery whatever it is remember to forgive yourself because it's not your fault and you must always learn to forgive yourself first because you didn't do anything you have nothing to be blamed for only the predator or that bad actor should be blamed and when people talk to me they'll say I should have stopped him. I should have said something. I could have run away. I could have, could have, should have. Don't could or should on yourself. Just know that you kept yourself safe. You need to forgive that voice, that little girl or little boy inside of you and move forward and just know that not only do you matter, but you have the power for change, to change your life and other people's lives and only the predator is at fault. They deserve the blame and shame. You do not. Well, that's our show. Judge Aquilina, thank you for being on the show with us today. My pleasure. It's, it was so much fun. And Aline and Jess, thanks for, uh, for co-hosting. And Aline, thank you for uh, putting this together. Yeah, it's absolutely my pleasure. I just want to add some things. There are some ways for people to kind of learn a little bit more about you and hear a little more of what you have to say. So you have a website. RosemaryAquilina.com. There's also, I do a podcast called Warrior Women Speak with a therapist friend of mine, Sherry Botwin. I'm also on Instagram, Twitter. You can buy my books on Amazon or Audible. You can text me. You can find me on Facebook. Always happy to chat. Love to come out and speak with your organization. And this has just been my honor to be here. What she said. <laughs> thank you so much. And what kind of miscarriage of justice would it be if I didn't thank you, Shortcoats, for making us a part of your week? If you're new and you like what you heard today, follow the show wherever fine podcasts are available, like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. Thank you to this week's editor, Angela Mahoney, and to the producer of the show. I already thanked you, Aline, but I'm going to thank you again. Aline Sandu. I'll take all the things I can get. The show is made possible by a generous donation by Carver College of Medicine, student government, and ongoing support from the Writing and Humanities program. Our music is by Dr. Vox and Catmosphere. I'm Dave Etler saying, don't let the bastards get you down. Talk to you in one week.
Hi, short coats. Look, life in medical education, life in America, life in the world is often difficult. And I often wish I could help. All I have is this podcast, but in my wildest dreams, you have the support you need to lead a life of your choosing. You deserve to be happy, healthy, and successful in whatever ways you define those words. So if you need support because you've experienced racism, discrimination, harassment, mental health crises, I want you to be able to get the help that you need. And so I'm going to put some links in the show notes to some resources that you can use. But the bottom line is that for what it's worth, I see you. I know you're out there. I wish I could do more. Maybe I can in ways that I don't understand yet or know about. But I see you and I'm glad you're here and other people are too. This Short Code podcast is a proud member of the MedEd Media Network. Inspiration, information, and guidance on your journey to medical school and beyond at mededmedia.com.